big and fast reminds us of who? Julio Jones, Calvin Johnson, like these guys that have really hit the peaks of peaks in the NFL at the receiver position. They aren't the smalls. They are the bigs and they are the fast. Welcome in to the Hot Read Podcast for, what is it, Wednesday? Uh, no, Friday. Friday, April the 12th. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, director of published content here at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network, and you can follow me on social media at Easton Freeze. I'm joined, as always, by producer JT, who you can follow on social media at JT underscore Runky. JT, how are we doing? I'm good. I, I see that our comment section has also been infected by the sketch virus. It's yeah. just, it's taking over everywhere. Like He's from every his, NFL like, team. Three months of viral fame, probably. I don't know. Maybe more. We'll I see. mean, it hit the masters it's, today as well. So did it. Okay. Bryson G. Chambeau was up there doing, doing special teams, special plays, special players as well. So you know, he had a good enough round. He can just do whatever he wants. I'd imagine. <laughs> um, we're talking receivers today and we thought who better to bring on for a very fun episode of our positional draft series. than friend of the show, three time, guest of the hot read podcast austin gale audience engagement manager over at the ringer one of my favorite publications austin how are we doing man doing great thanks for having me on guys we're happy to have you and we are excited to talk about what is a really exciting wide receiver group um we had you on for this exact episode last year and it was a i mean a fun receiver group but i don't think it really stands up in comparison to what is a, a really good group at the, at the top and also just depth wise. There's a lot of really fascinating prospects in this draft class. And we're going to be going through our collective top 10 guys today. Before we dive into those 10 guys, I wanted to pose the question uh, when you're putting together your receiver big board and we're, we're trying to pick 10 guys to talk about today. Who's the guy later down in the draft, a day two, day three guy where you're like doing the kombucha girl where you're like, no, if I was being irresponsible, maybe I'd find a way to slip them into this list. Is there a guy that you're really high on that's further on down the draft board? Probably Malachi Corley, Western Kentucky wide receiver, who I feel is a freak, freaky, freaky yak player. Uh, 70 career force missed tackles, according to PFF, has one of the better yak profiles we look at from a production profile standpoint that we've seen enter the draft. Um, I, I like him a lot. I think there's people who've made Debo Samuel comparisons. That's a little rich. Um, sure. But I think I, I do think that he is like a fun gadgety player that maybe there is a chance in the NFL as he's picked in day two, day three, he finds a role as this kind of like smaller yak type with who's like super physical. That's what I keep coming back to. Like maybe why I want to put him in the top 10 is he isn't a player that is he's he's very shifty. He's kind of got this like, you know, um, got this, like, a very like good juking ability, good short area mm -hmm. quickness, can avoid contact. But what I like about him more and more is that he runs through contact as well. And that's where people I think do pick up really the Debo Samuel comps. He didn't crack my top 10, but honestly, after, after wide receivers four, five in this class, I do feel like you're kind of picking your flavors. You're picking, you're, people always say that every year, it's like, pick your flavor, blah. The top of the draft, you're looking for number one receiver who can be a legitimate 100, 120 target guy in any offense. Mm -hmm. After that, and I think there are like three, maybe four guys like that in this class. Others where you're, you're, the range of outcomes is a little bit wider or a wholesale a little bit lower. So when you do get to, you know, the A.D. Mitchells, the Keon Coleman's, the Malachi Corley's, the Javon Bakers of this class, where you're like, oh, I kind of like him because he does this, but I don't really like him because he can't do this. You kind of ultimately have to pick what fits into your offense because I think a big part of receivers having success in the NFL is can they find a role on your team? Can they find a role in the slot? Can they find a role as the wide receiver four, the wide receiver five? What's their mm -hmm. special teams ability? Can they play kick return? Can they play kick, you know, kick off? It, it, with the new rules, does that change things? With Xavier Leggett, that's something I'm thinking about as well. I do think that after you get past the X amount of wide receivers that have wide receiver one top of the market team target share potential, after that, you're kind of picking what fits into your offense. Yeah, I, I, that's 100%. Um, I, I agree that the top four-ish guys are in a, in a different category, and then it is totally a pick-your-flavor thing. Um, I, I love that you mentioned Javon Baker. He was going to be my answer to this question. Um, he's somebody uh, also... What the both of the Washingtons intrigue me, Malik and um uh Taj. I, I think they're both interesting guys on day three. Uh let's get to these top 10 guys though. And we we compiled my board and your board and JT's board, and we have nine of the same guys. So we'll talk about them in a minute. Nice. We each have one uh, that we have to stand in a soapbox for that the others do not have. And I can go ahead and talk about my guy who's Roman Wilson out of Michigan. Uh 
what keeps him low on the board, and I think everybody's board, is just the size limitations. He is a slot only, I think. There may be some Y or some some Z capability for him, but you know, I he, he comes in really, really um, limited both in in height and weight, but also just length, 12th percentile arms. Um, so there's limitations in terms of how big of a target he can be and whether or not he can he can win vertically. But man, saw him at the senior bowl for the first time up close and was really putting on an impressive display there. Um, you watch him go through the drills at the combine and he's impressive with his athleticism that he does some things that guys of his size profile you typically don't see, you know, being a hands catcher instead of um, being a body catcher being a guy that can win in short area, but I think also does have some versatility with some more of the intermediate routes. And then, you know, it has a little bit more plus after the catch ability than a guy of his size. I just like a lot of what he's done. And frankly, one of the biggest reasons why I have him higher uh, than a lot of folks is that like, you know, it's, it's hard to love the situation that the, the passing game that he was in at Michigan. I, I don't really know whether or not he was tapped out or even close to tapped out in terms of reaching the, the highest potential. I, I'm, I'm hoping he goes to a place where, it's a heavier pass passing offense. He can be used in a um, used more more often, but also just in a more diverse way than he was in college. Because I think that there's some untapped potential there. I, I like Roman Wilson a lot. He's not in my top ten. I think part of the reason for that is it's a it's a deep wide receiver class, and again, it's kind mm -hmm. of a pick your flavor type of thing. For me, what what keeps him out of the top ten? is when you talk about range of outcomes right he is a slot only player in the nfl in my opinion i don't i yeah. don't see him being an a, an outside receiver you want to dedicate outside receiver routes and targets and production to he is going to be someone that at his best the peak of his outcomes i think is a very 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 productive slot receiver the same sure. slot receiver everyone hoped hunter renfro would be the same slot receiver everyone hoped kj hamler would be the same mm -hmm. slot receiver you get the picture right like these guys come out every single year oh he's like five foot ten five foot eleven pretty quick gets in and out of his routes and i think he could be a really good slot in the nfl for whatever reason these guys don't hit at the volume that maybe we expect every single year. Right. Like a Kyle Phillips is, is a great example they, of that, right? Yes. They have limited doors to getting on the field, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, to get on the field, I need you to be the slot guy. I need you to win every route, catch everything. You need to be this Wes Welker type that everyone's been chasing since he retired. And it's just a very hard player to be in the league. It's, you have to be in the white ride. There's a lot of teams also that are going away from this size in the slot. Like people want a big slot. I'd mm -hmm. rather have an Allen Robinson or in this, you know, in this year's class, a Keon Coleman working from the slot, my offense, than I would rather have say a Roman Wilson or some of these other slot guys that we're going to talk about. That's where I think some of these limitations are. Do, can he win on the outside? Maybe. Is he going to be someone that every single year I'm looking to replace if he's my outside receiver? Yes. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the difference. And mm -hmm. that's no slight to him, his area or his tracks, let's call them tracks, not doors, tracks to opportunity. And when I say opportunity, I mean snaps and targets in the NFL is limited. For that reason, I want to take a bet on a guy with some longer arms that's a little bit taller. That, that's like honestly where I kind of stand with him. That's not to say Fair. he's not a good player. It's just that if I'm making this bet, it better be low, low place, right? I don't want it to be top of the second round type of bet. I like him actually probably more in the third round. And that's why I think he's a super pick your flavor guy because the yeah, the, yeah. the road is really narrow for him. He there's a very specific skill set that I think is only going. You know, there may be five teams in this draft that are really looking at him as a a you know high third low second round guy because mm -hmm. they think he would be a particular um a particular use in in their system in particular. Uh, you, you mentioned like the versatility that a slot only guy can can up his stock with. Like if you can do something else for us, like win as a returner. Uh, that I think is a great transition to JT's guy who's Xavier to get out of South Carolina. Um, somebody that is a bigger body, somebody that is, um, you know, versatile, both in terms of where you line them up, but also as a potential returner, JT make the case for Xavier to get in the top 10. So Xavier Leggett has been one of those guys, this, this entire draft process that I feel like he has gone just, he is free fall to come coming back up at the combine to just being everywhere on everybody's board. But at the end of the day, I had to put him on here because he's been one of my guys since probably the college season. And I was looking at my list and I said, there's going to, there's all these great guys, but there's this one guy. If I got to put him on my list, I'm going to put him on my list because I think the potential for him to develop into something more than what he is right now, I think is the reason I have him on my board. Just the measurables for him is something that I really like at his size 6'1", 221, which is good for 90th percentile in weight. But then you look at some of his, you know, 10-yard splits. He ran a 4'3", uh, 40 at the combine. His 1'5", 
uh, 10 yard split along with his 20 yard split, which is pretty much tied for what Brian Thomas Jr. ran at the combine. He has that, that, you know, X factor speed that you want in a guy that when you're comping him to more of the, the style of a DK Metcalf or an AJ Brown, that's what you want. I think the big thing for him though, is how he got to this position, right? You look at the tape and you look at his, his performance in the past and you look, well, he only had production in one year and that production absolutely skyrocketed in that last year. And that's where I have to push back and why I still have him on my, on my top 10 board here is because of the, the tumultuous path that he had to get to this spot, you know, coming out of coming out of high school, he played every position basically, but wide receiver before he got to South Carolina playing quarterback, running back and safety on the defensive side of the ball. Um, You know, having, having a a pretty um, a troubled past, just having to deal with the family issues, you know, losing his mom and dad before he got to college. A, A lot of those things that, that can, uh, kind of stunt your development and, you know, coming into the, into a South Carolina system that has had major changes o- over the years and finally getting to be able to play with a, a better caliber quarterback like Spencer Rattler, you kind of saw what he can put on tape. He's going to be the guy that is your deep th- ball threat. And I think that he plays in that mold of, you know, Traylon Burks, but you're not putting the Traylon Burks expectations of a round one caliber guy on him from day one. And that's why I really do like him because you're going to get him in the late second, early third. And he's that guy who, like you said, I think could be really useful um, in this new kickoff rule with, with the way he runs the jet sweep and some of those plays they played in that Beamer offense at South Carolina, as well as a guy who can develop into that wide receiver too that, uh, on, on a team that can be that deep vertical threat. I, I think Leggett is someone that I, more so than Wilson, I battled in terms of internally <laughs> on whether or not I wanted to include him in my top 10 because mm-hmm. of a lot of things that you said and that he is big and he's fast. And uh, I've fallen for the big fast before as, as everyone has, you know, I think it's not all that different to the Traylon Burks conversation. It's not all that different to the Jonathan Mingo conversation. We have this conversation mm-hmm. every single year. This guy's big and fast. Right. Uh, uh, coach, coach, uh, this guy, uh, big and fast. Big and fast. And we all just like, <laughs> yeah, we just all fall in love with him. And then we all try and find reasons, not excuses. We try and find reasons for why he wasn't the uber productive receiver um, at the college level all four years of his career or all two years, three years of his career, whatever it may be. This is what I always come back to. The, us screaming he's big and fast on this call and any GMs and any front offices that are screaming he's big and fast on this call, were they not screaming that at the college level too? Were they not saying he's big and fast too and he didn't produce, right? I, I feel the same way about Brian Thomas Jr. I feel the same way about A.D. Mitchell. Brian Thomas Jr. was losing targets out to Kayshawn Booty two years ago. Like, like <laughs> why? He's big and fast. He's big right. and fast. We keep bringing yeah. it up. He was big and fast two years ago. Finding the reasons why these guys that are the prototypical size and speed to go into the NFL and be these like first round peg. Listen to Ben Solak talk about any big and fast receiver over the last five years. Guy falls in love because big and fast reminds us of who? Julio Jones, Calvin Johnson, like these guys that have really hit the peaks of peaks in the NFL at the receiver position. They aren't the smalls. They are the bigs and they are the fast. With Leggett, you mentioned the expectations point. That's how I get on board. You're telling me I get Leggett at the back end of the second, top of the third, and he's going to immediately become this kick returner in the new kickoff rules. Now I'm starting to get convinced. You tell me I got to spend a high second on him in the same way that we had to spend a high second on Denzel Mims and a high second on Jonathan Ingle, all these other big and fast guys. I'm, a, I'm good. I'm good. I'll, I'll let someone else make that decision. I'll let someone else invest. Because here's the other thing too. When you are drafting these guys that have one year of experience, one year of legitimate production, how are you committing resources to make sure they hit their high side of variance? Because that's that's commitment in time, money, whatever it is, and making sure he adds the tools necessary. Are you asking your wide receivers coach, say it's the Chiefs, to work with the get at the what, what at the pace and the intensity necessary to him his reach his peak outcomes because he's big and fast? Or are you going to say I still need to figure out Sky Moore? I still we still don't know what we're doing with this other guy. Mm-hmm. That that it's so much of a development question as much as it is an expectations question. The least of the conversation is how talented he is because that's the most obvious thing we've got. Dude's big, dude's fast, can make the play with the ball in his hands. He's got frames similar to Cordero Patterson. I think that's like a similar comp in terms of like how you want to use him. I, for those players and the receiver position more than anything, we need to constantly think about how are they getting on the football field, who's actually working with them to get freaking better at all the different things you need to get better. And then also that's why 
Every year we go to the combine. We, you guys were there. I remember meeting you guys up in Indy. We stand in front of these GMs. We stand in front of these coaches, and we ask them what they're looking for. They don't bring up the testing. They don't own, They bring up the interviews. <laughs> they say, "I got to talk to this guy. Where's his head at? How com- how committed he is to the game? How committed he is to getting better? Does he is he self aware of the, the weaknesses that he has? Do you remember Jalakai Polite, the Florida edge defender, who was like, "Yeah, I had this meeting with whoever it was. They told me I sucked at a lot of things, and I wasn't ready to hear for it." That guy's not in the league. Like you find, I'm not saying Leggett is that guy. I haven't heard anything nearly like that but this is an example of like this player to reach his peak range of outcomes is going to need some work do we have the people in the building that can help him with that and is he committed to put that work in you answer both those questions that's how you vault a guy up to top of the second round with xavier Leggett because he is big and fast and this time of measurables do make sense for me i had some other guys ahead of him but i do think he's a really talented player and i like him a lot i just want to make sure you know, I feel like I don't want to fall into the same trap that I've fallen in before. Where with a lot of these other big and fast guys, we have to make sure we're asking the question: They're big and fast two years ago. Why weren't they in the position to to having all the success early on? Almost every truly unstoppable NFL receiver is big and fast and good. And when you're big and fast, you feel like <laughs> oh, you're almost home. But you have to be good too. Yes, like that yes, is also yes. an important tenet of it. Um, speaking mm-hmm. of big but not so fast, number ten on JT and I's board and number eight on your board is. One of the most, like, he's a, an, an enigma inside of a puzzle, inside of a riddle. Uh, Keon Coleman, wide receiver out of FSU. Very big, great size, you know, 86th percentile height, 77th percentile weight, 17th percentile 40-yard dash. Had a combine that was not great uh, from, a like, a statistical standpoint for his, for his uh, draft stock. But when you watch the tape, he is, like, the number one that boy nice enjoyer kind of guy to watch. Like, it's just... It, it what you see with your eyes doesn't quite match the the analytical profile. Um, you have him mm-hmm. at eight on your list, which is higher than JT or I have. Like, make the case for a Keon Coleman in the second round. It, it sucks that the analysis is that simple, but I do still feel like he's good. I, he's good at catching the football, and I think yeah. that he is someone where when you talk about what are the commitments I'm going to have to make as a staff to make this guy hit his range of outcomes. I feel really good about him coming into the building and already knowing how to play the wide receiver position, like already knowing how to attack the mm. football in the air, already knowing how to win in his way. I think he needs help with obviously some of the short area stuff and some of the quickness stuff. And can we get this guy any faster? Sure. But I think one of the bigger takeaways I had from the combine, him doing the gauntlet drill in the same way that yep. uh, another very fast receiver, Troy Franklin did the gauntlet drill and him being the faster of the two, despite running completely different forties, Troy Franklin being faster and, Keon Coleman being a tad slower, Keon Coleman runs that faster because he knows how to catch the football and he knows how to attack the football and he has comfortable soft hands. Troy Franklin is a different story, right? His ball skills are not the same. And I think when I got to, again, when I get to this point in my rankings where I already feel like I've hit on guys that can be true number ones, be guys that are demanding the football week in and week out, I start to think about what skill set do I admire? What skill set am I looking for compared to these other guys? And with Keon Coleman, what I keep coming back to is like, man, at least I get someone who can catch the football. If I put him in the slot, and he, I'm not asking him to win on the outside. I'm not asking him to separate it on that route tree. And he can just eat underneath and catch everything I throw him and be kind of what Allen Robinson was in the middle of mm. his career. I know that's the most common comp with Keon Coleman. Right. That I'll take. I'll take it. Right. I think I don't think Keon Coleman is someone that you're going to draft and then you hope turns into you know the the Devontae Parker dream fully realized. Right. Maybe Devontae <laughs> Parker. People forget Mike Mayock had him as the number nine overall player on his board. Why was Parker ranked that highly back then? That was 2015 because he got up and could catch the football. He wasn't that fast either, right? It was a big, big difference in how we view the receiver position. Now we're so far removed from Devontae Parker and maybe scarred from Devontae Parker that we see another Keon Coleman type and we kind of run and hide. But there's a reason Devontae Parker's still in the league. I think that catching the football actually matters and being able to win in contested catch situations is this like reliable skill set that does have like predictive and year over year like stickiness that I am looking forward to with Keon. Is, is there a chance that he's my wide receiver eight? I have some others below him, some others above him. Is there a chance he goes up higher above that? Yes, it depends on the range of outcomes he hits. I guess I'm just really confident if I'm a team looking for a player to win catches right now from the slot, I think Coleman's that guy. JT, anything on Coleman? Yeah, I, I would say I certainly, that's where I have him at 10, right? Because because when you're yeah. looking at it for, for a wide receiver one perspective, I, I just, there's a lot of things I see on tape, especially with just kind of the the the, the testing he did and the way he runs, 
Um, it, it takes him. He, once he gets the ball in his hand, he can be that guy who's making plays for you. But as a wide receiver, one on the outside, the route running ability, I, I still think needs a lot of polish in his game. So like you were saying, if you're going mm-hmm. into the draft with expectations that he is going to start out as a wide receiver two or three and play that slot position for your team and work and eat under the underneath, I think that's something that can really work for his game. But if you're like the Chiefs and you want this outside guy, bringing him into that that situation right away I think you're setting him up for failure in that in that aspect and I think that's been the conversation this entire draft cycle is that Keon Coleman has been as high as going late in the first round and as low as currently kind of where he is at at the back of the second round and I think that's kind of what what is once again with with these back guys who who are bigger and and faster it's what are your expectations for them right out right out of the gate especially I think where where you look at him right now uh, there's been a lot of you know talking about him to a team like the Buffalo Bills and now with them without Stefan Diggs. Well, if you're bringing him in, in that late first round to be in a Stefan Diggs replacement, I don't think that's going to work out for you. And that's no. where like, like a Xavier Leggett as well. If you're bringing him in to replace that Stefan Diggs hole, I'm talking about he's wide receiver two behind Curtis Samuel. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to, you're going to uh, kind of regret making that pick. So high. I, I don't think these guys, these two guys, are similar players, obviously, in, like, size, speed, you know, like, in terms of a measurables comp, but I feel like it's very similar to how we talked about Jaden Reed last year. Jaden Reed mm. wasn't the fastest guy, wasn't, like, this mm. athletic profile guy where you're like, oh, my God, he's going to come in and be this, like, explosive firework. You're like, he just catches the goddamn football. Like, he, ca- you watch the Michigan State tape, everyone just kept saying the same thing. It's like, I don't really know how he's doing it. He's not that big, but, like, he goes up in these contested catch situations and it's his ball. And he's already – Drafted in the middle of the second round, a little mid-late second round. He's already had a really strong impact, obviously, in, a, in a kind of what's becoming a loaded young wide receiver room in Green Bay. But if if Keon Coleman is that kind of production, that's a win in the middle of late second round. And I think that's what he can be because like, Jaden Reed is not like a blow-the-top-off speed guy. He's got – you know, his measurables aren't stuff that you're like comping to Calvin Johnson or anything like that with like a Brian Thomas Jr. or A.D. Mitchell and some of these other guys that we're obsessed with. But he is someone that has a proven track record of going up and getting the football. And I think that matters sometimes uh, at the receiver position. He's a he gets on base kind of guy. And some of the yeah. uh, advanced analytics, like if it's a little bit of narrative building because there's a lot of analytics that that point towards him not being the best prospect. But like real analytics going through their athletic wide receiver draft prospect grading system. He, he's a 96-7, which is above a Brian Thomas Jr., above a Ricky Pearsall, above a Malik Neighbors, above an A.D. Mitchell, above a Xavier Worthy. So like his in-game play, like, like you mentioned with the, the combine gauntlet drill versus where he runs the 40, um, the actual football playing seems to be better than the, the testing does. Let's talk about Xavier Worthy, who is a extreme, maybe the, the complete opposite kind of prospect. Um a lot of production in college, but very small, very fast guy. Uh, he, he comes in on the um, much smaller side, but on the e- extremely fast side, breaking the combine record for a 40 yard dash. Um, one of two really fantastic wide receiver prospects out of Texas this year. He's your number 10 player, Austin. Uh, he's eight for me and eight for JT. We, we talked a lot about him at the combine, you know, like the, the historical profile for a guy of this size and this speed, the sexiness of the speed is kind of a, it, it's, it's kind of a trap. It seems that these guys tend not to work out, but there's something a little bit different about Xavier worthy. He seems less like a track guy who they try to make play football and more of a football player that is also kind of a track guy. If that makes sense. I think he's got better football skills than a lot of the crazy fast guys that have come before him, the John Rosses of the world. But I, mm-hmm. Make the case for a Xavier Worthy working out in the NFL. Yeah, I think it's you know the 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 cover of the book is small and fast, right? I think that when you get when you actually open it up and and see how quickly he was productive at Texas, that's what gets me interested. Right? He is someone that right away he was the option in, mm-hmm. at, at Texas. Right away, right away he was the guy. In his true freshman season, he had 105 targets. No other player on the team had more than 45. Right, this guy's and remember, he's not big and fast. He's small. He's 160 pounds, running a 4-2 speed. Yet he's de- he's demanding as a true freshman at 18 years old, 50 more targets than any other player on the team. Mm-hmm. The next year he leads the team in target share again, and then this past year, there's this other guy, AD Mitchell, maybe he's going top 15, top 20, some people think. He gets 30 more targets than that guy. You know, <laughs> and like you could say, "Oh, they had different roles. Like AD Mitchell was a downfield deep threat." Xavier Xavier Worthy's average at the target was only like six years off of A.D. Mitchell's. Yeah, they played different roles. Xavier's was the one that got the football. So right. I, I, sometimes how a player is used at the college level and the intensity at which he's used 
is actually really telling of the kind of player that he is. When you earn targets at the college level, and that's why when you get to like dominate a rating and breakout age and all this shit, like it reminds me a lot of Rondell Moore, right? Rondell Moore as a true freshman at Purdue was like, give me the football and you'll win the game. And he did, right? And that, and that is why so many people were enamored with his breakout age and like how much he demanded the football. Now Rondell Moore has not become the player that I think a lot of people expected him to become, but I think we had too high expectations for him. We were a little too excited. It's like, oh, this small little fast muscle hamster, this guy, this guy could be inter- interesting. We have made, I, mean, you, you, I, I think that the better expectations were worthy and where I think maybe he ultimately goes is like exactly what Pop Douglas was able to do for New England, where he comes in and mm. you're like, okay, this guy's got some juice to him. Maybe I do funnel him a couple targets. Maybe I do see what I get out of this. What, what, what? You put in a dollar. What do I get back? Is it a candy? Is it a sticky hand? What, what am I getting? With Pop Douglas, you put in a dollar. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a little screen behind the line of scrimmage. And next thing you know, he's going for twenty yards. Like, oh shit! Right. I got, a, I got a diamond. I got a diamond ring. And I think Xavier Worthy, as he did at Michigan as a true freshman, is going to be someone that the offensive coordinator is going to put a dollar in and get a race car out. You know, he's, he's going to get a, the return on investment. I think is going to be significant now. If the 40 time and all that stuff bumps him up to being like a top 40 pick or like top, like top you know, that, that to me is like a little rich just cause he is mm-hmm. small and he's going to be someone that's going to take some hits. He's going to be someone that, you know, hundred targets three years in a row at Texas. Obviously he was able to stay healthy for the most part in the NFL. It's a little bit of a different game. The wear and tear is different. You play more games, blah, blah, blah. That's where a top 50 pick gets a little scary. But if you're someone he's telling, you're telling me I can get this kind of player at the back end of the second round, knowing that he's small, but he is this jitterbug that has commanded targets, does have experience being not a guy, but the guy in an offense. I, I, I do think I get excited by that. W- will he go higher than probably where I would take him? Probably just because of the speed element. But man, he's someone that if he's still on the board in the third round, sprint the card in. I mean, who, who else do you want to be designing? targets to even if it's just like three or four four or five targets a game in his true true you know his rookie season i think you're going to get a positive return on that investment and that's why i i that's why i had him a little higher than some of these other guys who who are mm-hmm. you know bigger and faster he's smaller and faster but the way that he was playing and the way like you said commanded the targets in in the way he was productive from the get-go is why i think that he could be uh elevate to that next level of the game the main problem I have with him is like you said, you know what you put, you put a dollar in that machine, you get more in return. Well, what happens when that machine breaks and breaks and see, <laughs> yeah. uh, the entire machine kind of go down, like in the kind of Hollywood Brown archetype, or even this last year, the, the, mm-hmm. the tank Dell archetype, what happens when it's so good. And then it just all comes crumbling down because of the size. I mean, he is a absolute outlier in, in, in the size there to be that fast. And also still that small <laughs> is, is a little concerning uh, to me and why I, I'm, I'm with you that I wouldn't spend, you know, a first round pick on him because that is a lot of, of capital. You're putting in a guy that is most likely going to at least have an injury or two, if not more during his time in, in the league. All right, let's move on to the the next guy here on our list. Um, who should we talk about? Let's do Ricky Pearsall out of Florida. I I love the 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 case that is Ricky Pearsall. Um, he he's he's a a bigger player than Xavier Worthy, but not a big player. Six one one ninety, crazy athletic though. Crushed all the athletic testing in the pre draft process. Um, he's a he's a guy that you know. It, played with Anthony Richardson last year, but this past season or two years ago, this past season, however, not in the greatest of situations, despite that, what he did put on tape in his final season of college. I, I like it a lot. And I'm I like, I watch it and I struggle to find the reasons why he isn't higher on a lot of people's draft boards. Um, you know, he, he's going to go in I think a pretty reasonable range right there in that second, third round. Austin, what do you like about Ricky Pearsall? Obviously the athletic profile is there, right? I mean, he's, mm-hmm. he's, um, one, you know, 93rd percentile three cone that gets me moving 42, you know, 97th percentile vertical jump. I, I, I four, four, low four fours is great. I, I think he's a very athletic player. He's also someone that has really good hands. He's going to, he's going to have the highlight reel for the rest of his life. That one catch where he catches it against those two guys and he gets the big blow up. Yeah. I also feel that why I have him say ahead of a guy like worthy or ahead of a guy like Leggett or, or Corley or Roman Wilson is I think he can play on the outside. I think he yes. can also play in the slot. I think his pathways to the football field are a little bit wider, right? W- Worthy, even as good as he is, I don't know if he's ever going to be a true X on the outside. You know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't see that happening with Pearsall. I think you could get there. I don't know mm-hmm. if that range of outcomes is necessarily super high. I think there's a lot of concerns about 
you know, why, why is in his age 23 season, he's still only getting 87 targets and not cracking a thousand yards, hasn't had a season over five touchdowns. And one thing that I really do think is important in the pre-draft process with wide receivers is count the athleticism once. Okay. Yes. He's an athlete. He was an athlete last year too. And the two years before that, he was probably pretty athletic. Why have we not seen it put together? And Fair. that's so part about this process too, being like a media draft analyst, right? Like people in the media, like we don't talk about this pro- pro- problem enough, but like we aren't in the interview room. We aren't talking to coaches. Most of us aren't, right? We aren't like getting all of the details on injuries, you know, supporting casts, all this stuff. Like, you know, I, we, we're, we're probably not going to talk about this player in the top 10, but Jermaine Burton is a prime example. But like Huge. you turn on the yeah. tape and you're like, holy shit, this guy might be, this guy might have something. And then I tweeted out a highlight clip of Jermaine Burton. I get two texts from different coaches saying, yeah, stay away from this guy for whatever reason. I don't really have to get in. Right. But like, you don't, you don't have, you don't have all that information with these guys. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying Pearsall has any of that off the field baggage. What I'm saying is we don't know everything. We don't know why it took him this long, why he transferred, why all this stuff happened. All we know is he's this freaky athlete. And we're excited about him. We get him into the NFL. Hopefully we can figure out how to make it work. The exact inputs we're going to need to turn Ricky Pearsall into a 900 Four, no, 900 yard, four touchdown receiver at Florida into like a 1200 yard you know, number two option in the offense. I don't know. I don't know what inputs we're going to need. I know some comps have been thrown out there for Nate Burleson. I, Nate Burleson would be the high range of outcomes for him, right? That, that would be like, oh my God, this guy's going to be in the league for like 10 plus years and catch everything that's thrown his way. That mm-hmm. would be awesome. For me, he's the flyer you want to take when you have all the information. I'm excited by him. I know his range of outcomes is going to be wide receiver one, wide receiver two material. He could even go into the slot. That w- that's what makes him different. Better understanding the tat, you know, the tattoo that where he spells out humble with a deck of cards. Like I, that's that, those are the questions man. I need to know. Yeah, that's what I need to know. I just need to know these little pieces. I need to understand the pieces of the puzzle. Fair. Yeah, I, I mean, he is my version of I guess when when watching him on tape for Easton's that boy nice Coleman. Like I, I love watching Ricky Pearsall. Just the ability, the, the route running ability is crisp. It, it's it matches everything with the athletic. Like you said, it's going to take the perfect situation for him to really be that wide receiver mm-hmm. one, you know, I think in Mel Kuyper's draft to the Titans, he was, they drew, they selected him to the Titans in, in round two. I, I don't know if that really works out in, in the way that you want it. And now learning behind a Deandre Hopkins and Calvin Ridley, maybe that is the, the right situation for him. But currently I, I just don't see the puzzle pieces fitting there. Um, but yeah, like, he has everything that, you know, from the athletic perspective to succeed. It's just putting it together. If you could hand place him mm-hmm. on to a team right now, what, what do you think the ideal situation is for a, a Pearsall? Uh, path of the offense, maybe, maybe Chiefs. You know, Ch- Chiefs in the second yeah. round would be mm-hmm. something. I'm, you know, you see Rasheed Rice going through some stuff right now. I think I just saw yep. the tweet, him facing eight charges or something that has happened here. I, I, right. I don't know what's going to happen. I, they need guys who can catch the football and win routes. And he's someone that he's got a path to the football field. I want when I'm drafting these guys, I don't want to. It's different. It's like you don't want to just like stash him as my wide receiver, wide receiver five, and he's like battling to play punt return for two years. I want to find a way to get him targets and like. If I don't feel like I have that opportunity for him to be like, especially if I'm spending like a second or third rounder on him, right? Like if right. I don't feel like I have that opportunity for him to be like a wide receiver three, wide receiver four, at least compete for those two spots, I'm probably going to take another position, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go look at guard. I'm going to go look at tackle. And like, I'm a guy who says draft for value, not for need, right? Like draft for value, draft for need. Mm-hmm. There is a, there's a part of the equation where like a team that drafts Ricky Pearsall, but can't, he can't even crack wide receiver four on the roster you're right. doing him a disservice and you're not giving him the full opportunity to develop him so identifying team and teams that feel like he can come in and compete for wide receiver three wide receiver four i think those are the kinds of teams that are going to be looking for him on day two yeah. i think another one would be maybe even like you could look at the new orleans saints right now we really have chris Olave, mm-hmm. maybe a second year of relevance in uh rashid shaheed and then you know maybe at perry finds his way into some more packages there especially in the red zone we saw how good he was but they lack that 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 true number two right now behind Chris Olave that I feel like he could work well into yeah. that system. Austin, I, uh, with JT as my witness, I've been asking for like three weeks now. I need somebody to sell me on a Troy Franklin out of Oregon, who you have as your sixth <laughs> overall wide receiver in this class. You, you mentioned the gauntlet from the combine. You look at some of his, you know, his, his, yeah. uh, his drop rate in college. Like there are certainly reasons to be concerned about a Troy Franklin. And it's feel like that's all <laughs> I see. Clearly you see reasons to like Troy Franklin. So please give them to me. I, I think that Troy Franklin at six is a little rich. I agree that I'm high on him. I think okay. that I do. I do like the arm length. I do like the speed. Sure. And I feel like he is someone too, that 
in an offense, we haven't really been able to see him unlock to his full potential because of how much they want to throw the football underneath. Bonus. I, I, I will say Troy, Troy Franklin is someone where if I'm taking him as the sixth receiver off the board, I probably need a little bit more information on how far away are we from fixing some of these ball skills, right? Mm -hmm. How sticky, how sticky is this problem? Um, the other piece of it is you want to talk to him about, you know, see, he just has, he didn't run a full route tree at Oregon. And like, I'm, I hate betting on these guys sometimes too. We're like, we said, we've had this conversation about Corey Coleman. We had this conversation about Denzel Mann. It's like, well, we played in the offense where we didn't really, it's like, maybe if he, I, I got to solve those problems before I take him as the wide receiver six why he's above and you know i guess i'm going to tease my list a little bit here like why he's above guys like ad mitchell keon mm -hmm. coleman mickey pearsall xavier worthy like troy franklin's like the last guy on the line playing with the shield saying like i could be a wide receiver one austin i swear Trust Fair. Me, i could maybe Fair. get there he's yep. like the last one on the line because as soon as you leave him and you go to ad mitchell who's my wide receiver seven i'm sure we'll talk about later he has a disastrous a analytics profile like Andy Mitchell is like the exact guy we fall for every single year that doesn't pan out right, right. he's the DJ Chark he's the mm. um you know even Taylor's here with Bay he's like oh he's tall and he's fast he had one year of production and next thing you know some huge games I, I think right. they, yeah 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 like we fall for these guys every single like Kevin White was another example uh, um Chris Conley is another example like I feel like that's mm. that's those are some of the comps that I think about with AD Mitchell with Troy Franklin there's enough there that he's improved on as well over time where I'm like, I think he can avoid this, but I still think there's a high percentage chance. He ends up being that guy. They're, 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 when you get to the wide receiver six of this class, you're, you're taking some freaking risks. There. Uh, we can, I mean, just like, I, I, you I guess I didn't sell what, you on him, but I'm sorry. But no, I, no. So I, like, I, here's I, the thing. Here's the thing. I'm, I'm, I would be sold on him if we could, like you say, like, I need to get in a room with the guy and I need to talk to people that are smarter than me about this. Like how sticky is the you know is the drops issue is that something that we overrate in the process i just i don't know the answer to that and if the answer is yeah it's you know year to year it's it's not it's not a lot of stickiness to that there's a lot of variance involved then maybe i because i i do generally agree with you that in terms of a true wide receiver one there being any ceiling there for a guy like he's the last one on the line there so we can move on to an ad mitchell who you, who you mentioned having a disastrous analytical profile um a lot of talk about him after the combine in particular where he absolutely killed it uh, you being a potential first round pick, big game player, man, you know, he definitely put some really impressive games in high profile situations together. Um, but then if you like, look at the totality of what he put on tape, he got a bad case of the disappears a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the highs are so high, uh, you know, 90, 90, here's an interest. There's some stats of his, you say a disastrous analytical profile. There are some things that stand out to me. It's like, wow, you know, maybe there is something to this guy. 96th percentile, according to SIS for on target catch rate, which is eighth in all of college football at, at any level. It's so like when the ball was thrown his way, he caught the darn ball. He's got great body control, great hands. Like I think, I think landing spot matters more for him maybe than any other guy, you know, coaching out some inconsistencies, have him start as a high end wide receiver too at, at, at best. But you clearly don't see him as uh, as much more than just a big gamble in this draft class. Is that fair? It's, de it's definitely a gamble. I mean, he's someone that lost. He left Georgia because Lad McConkey, and there's some people who have Lad McConkey lower on their list than Ad Mitchell. Like he is right. someone who lost route or lost targets to Xavier Worthy, and I understand why they're different in terms of their NFL. Cap. Like this is someone who's never been the guy in an offense. Mm -hmm. He's not earned that spot. Now, do I think he's a phenomenal talent? Do I think he's tall, fast? And has good ball skills opposite to Troy Franklin. Yes. Do I am I worried that it was it, we've only seen it kind of good for one year? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> am I also like because like we keep I hate my least favorite thing in the pre-draft process with wide receivers is we say, but he's tall and fast and he's big and fast and all that stuff. It's like he was big and fast last year. He was mm -hmm. big and fast last year, and he finished the season with 800 yards. Like it, Xavier Worthy out targeted him. Like he was big and fast last year. He was big and fast at Georgia and literally left Georgia because he couldn't win in, in that in that receiver room. I, I I want to understand more on how I unlock A.D. Mitchell. Georgia did too. Pro Texas probably did too. He just needs to play with an epic coaches. quarterback, Austin. Quinn Ewers yeah, and, and Stephen Bennett aren't yeah, cutting that's it. All that's the need. issue. No, and maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. I think that the, <laughs> the other – the other piece with Mitchell that scares me is the the lack of a yak profile. Like he's not someone that has uh, very good yak production. I'm not saying you have to be that guy to have success in the NFL, but it's just another wrinkle into the conversation on like what exactly am I getting here? 
Is this Chris Conley 2.0? And also where it gets really rich for me is you got to take this guy at like with the 24th pick or Bingo. the 26th pick. And it's like, man, we're going to see five, six receivers go in the first round. Hit rate on that position is probably somewhere around 30%. If I had to position my chips on which guy's not going to make it, I would say him over some of these other guys. Like at a certain point, we have to kind of just play the numbers. JT? Yeah, I think you bring up an interesting point that he, he moves to Texas because of Lad McConkey. And that I think for me, it, it I, I have him as my number five to Lad McConkey six. So I am one of those guys who does have A.D. Mitchell above a Lad McConkey. And I think that's more just because I question Lad McConkey's ability to, you know, stay on be the field. healthy and sure. stay on the field healthy, at, yeah. at the NFL yeah. level. I think that that is the thing right the big the big playability downfield is something that i think a lot of teams are going to look at ad mitchell over lad mcconkey and, and like more about the 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 opportunity to do that and that's why he's going to maybe go higher than than a lad mcconkey but i think it's so situational with these guys that that all of them are in this you know outside of the top 3 are going to bring such inherent risk that you really just have to hone in on your guy and and want to stick with him and this is a kind of a class where once you have your guy like you it, it, this is you have to put the chips in you have to put the work in to make this guy uh the high ceiling of what he could be so where in the draft to like wh at what point do you become comfortable with taking an ad mitchell it's not a 25 or, or you know 30 but yeah maybe maybe, maybe maybe top of the second round i mean it depends on the other players available always does um mm -hmm. but I think where he becomes like a legitimate value is probably middle of the second round for me, middle of the late of the second round, which I know is lower than whatever the people think. But like, I, you know, I have to, I have to look at if he goes to the bills and he's immediately asked to be a top or even like second mm -hmm. in targets that I don't know if it's going to go well in year one. Yeah, I don't think that's that. going to be great. I think it's going to take some time before he's, you know, really being able going to be able to assume that role. And I obviously could be wrong. I could be wrong. He could just completely show that he can be the guy that he never was at Georgia and never was at Texas with Buffalo Bills. Maybe it gets easier in the NFL, but I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Easy transition to uh, number five on my board, number five on Austin's board, number six on JT's, Lad McConkey, the guy that forced him out of Georgia. Size and injury concerns are really the only thing on my list for, you know, like things that I don't like about this guy. The rest, I'm in. I'm in on the rest of what Lad McConkey yeah. offers. Super polished. Um, I think he, uh, uh, you know, more more so than a Roman Wilson has some actual outside ability. I think that folks are are wrong to force him into a slot only conversation. Um, elite footwork, great tempo. He is able to get over top of DBs. He's shown that on tape. He's a QB, fr super friendly quarterback target. Uh, what do you like so much about him, Austin, to have him as your fifth fifth guy? I, I, I think you told me you can guarantee he's going to be healthy for 10 years. I think he has a career very similar to Tyler Lockett. I, I think he could be winning Love on that. the outside, even with a smaller frame, maybe a little over 30 inch arms. Yeah, that's short. But like, and I know Tyler Lockett over time has like, he's someone who goes right to the ground, does not be a yak threat. And like, I think Lab and Conkey right away wouldn't be that. But maybe over time, that's what you have to be, right? Like, if, when you it's are smart. that small and you're yeah. getting blasted by NFL players all the time, maybe when you catch the ball, it might be time to go down. Play the hand you're he dealt, is someone baby. that. Injuries are the biggest concern, and while I do feel like he can be an outside receiver, you are going to be limited by your size in the NFL. Like, it's not – it's not when you play some bigger corners, it's going to be tougher, right? And now he wins at the line of scrimmage. He's creating separation. When I talk to the guys at PFF, they're like, this guy has the best separation score among receivers that we've seen over the last couple of years. Like, I'm really excited by a lot of the data with him. I'm excited by a lot of the tape. I love the athletic profile. Stay healthy, and I'm there. I'm really there, and I, I just don't know if we can even guarantee that because I think he is going to be someone, given how he got hurt at Georgia, that's always kind of battling something, like always battling a, a hammy, an ankle, a back, or something like that, just because he is a little bit smaller, and we've seen over time at Georgia that he's someone who got consistently banged up. Yeah. Anything to yeah, add to that, JT? I think that everything, you, you hit the nail on the head there, but just the, his ability to shake defenders is something that when we saw him at the Senior Bowl, was, it just made me get right on the hype train. And around here, as we've continued to talk about Lad McConkey into this this um, kind of this this draft season, <laughs> we're like, yeah, well, if the if the train doesn't derail because of injury, then I, I'm right there with you. But I don't know if I want to get on that. I don't know if I want to get on that train. Yeah, yeah that's fair.
Like we, right, gotta, stop- we just have to bake in injury risk with his profile. Like just, oh, you have to, like, it's like, okay, like you're bringing this guy in. There's a good chance that he plays like, you know, an average of 11 ish games a year or maybe lower. And, and we have to be okay with that. Now, if our receiver room is loaded with a bunch of other guys who are like that, maybe this is a problem, but if we have some stable sturdies, we, we could maybe move forward. Well, and that's the, that's the exact reason why you, you can see a team, I think, in my opinion, make a foolish decision in that realm of the wide receivers coming off the board in the draft. Like you, you get there and they, they switch to we're going to draft for need and we need a guy that's going to be our alpha. We need a guy that we can rely on all season long. Well, let's go with an AD Mitchell, even, even though we think a lot of may has a, a better skill set in a vacuum. Uh, these top four guys we're about to talk about are the consensus top four. They are all of our top fours. We have them in a slightly different order, but um, everybody's four is Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. The other guy from Louisiana State University this year expected to be a mid first round draft pick. Um, fastest flying 20 at the combine of all the wide receivers, which is really crazy at his size. Cause he's a, a bigger boy and moves differently than like when I watch him on tape, the, the thing that stands out to me is there's a little bit of, well, I'm surprised he moves the way that he does at, at that size. I'm not really expecting that when I look at his profile. Um, and I think there's a, a big underrated element of his profile is man. This guy's still developing. He's not been playing football all that long. Um, and you see year over year, significant improvement. Austin, what do you like about a Brian Thomas jr? Big, fast, and I think that this year wasn't that he got more opportunity as much as it was. I think he just got better. And Earned it. obviously you still have you, you still have Malik Neighbors there, who was the leading receiver for LSU this previous year, and still demanded a lot of targets in that offense, right? There were still plays clearly drawn up for Brian Thomas Jr. to be the guy, even though, yes, they're different players, but offer similar top speed, offer similar deep threat ability, all those things. The fact that Brian Thomas Jr. was able to go toe-to-toe with Malik Neighbors and still put up a 1,200-yard season, I think is really impressive. Where I'm worried is last year, in terms of target share, Keisha Booty and tight end Mason Taylor both had more targets and Malik Neighbors had more targets than Brian Thomas Jr. Mm -hmm. As a true freshman, that list goes up to like five. Trey Palmer had more targets. J. Ray Jenkins had more targets. Jack Beck had more targets. This is a player that did not break out in terms of his developmental curve until this previous year. True. And can you confidently say, given the tape, given the conversations you have with his coaches, given the conversations you have with him, X, Y, Z, all this additional information, can you confidently say that this is an upward trend that he's continuing to build on? Or is this something that is more of a one-year wonder? I think with the tape alone, and having not talked with Brian Kelly and his fake accent or anything, I feel like we can confidently say Brian Thomas Jr. is someone who's on the way up. Right. Does he still need to get better at a lot of things? Would I like to see him work the intermediate and the short better? Sure. All that stuff can get better. He's still learning his body and still learning his frame and still learning how to get better. I come out of an interview with him and feel confident that he's going to hit that high side. I don't think he's going to turn into this other big, tall guy we drafted at the back end of the first or middle of the first that doesn't pan out. I think he can actually hit that. You you have to still say out loud he's a project. You have to. You cannot yeah. pretend Brian Thomas Jr finished deal in this thing where I feel like the prospects kind of maxed out is Roma Dunze. Ooh, I do think it's still getting better. Well, wow. Like Roma Dunze is someone like, if he's as good as he was at Washington, that's probably what you're expecting in the league. I don't think he's someone that's like transcending and still rising. He's someone that right. over time at Washington was that guy and got to this level. With Brian Thomas Jr., you have to be saying out loud that, yeah, we know that it might not be perfect right away. And if you can say that and you can commit the resources necessary to improving it, it's kind of the theme of this show. That is when I take a, take a big swing on Brian Thomas Jr. And there are so many teams just like where he's currently projected between like that number 12 and number 20, where y- you look at the look at a scenario, like maybe the Bengals, if they somehow try to load off of T Higgins and get a comp- consolation prize and a Brian Thomas Jr. to learn in that system, or, you know, the Jags who even signing a Gabe Davis still could use another wide receiver in that room uh, to make up for a Calvin Ridley. There are so many teams in, in that, in that tier there that I feel like Brian Thomas they're, they're looking at him as a, as a, as like you said, maybe a more of a project, but a guy who is transcending and, and could fit, you know, maybe a wide receiver three role in his first year, but has the, the opportunity to make uh, a lot in command, a lot more in an offense. All right, let's move on. We're uh, running out of time here, but we got to talk about these last three guys. Cause they are the best three guys in the class. And these guys are sick, man. I don't like, I, I don't really take issue with anybody having them in any order just because I love all three of these players. Let's start with Roma Dunze out of Washington because we were just mentioning him. He's my number two. He's JT's number two. He's your number three, Austin. Uh, let me just quickly, I'll briefly give the reason why I have him over a Malik Neighbors. I, I heard Dane Brugler the other day mention, you know, he, he said there's no such thing as a, a can't miss prospect, but the nicest thing he could say about Roma Dunze is 
that barring injury, he doesn't see a world in which Roman Dunze isn't a really productive NFL player. And I think that's a perfect way of describing him. I think that he is a more, he's a more traditional receiver than a Malik neighbors. And by my definition of a true wide receiver one, which is like the guy on third down at the end of the game where everybody knows the ball is everybody in the stadium knows it's going to this guy and there's nothing the defense can do about it. That's, that's a wide receiver like Ruma Dunze to me. Um, I see a, a versatile skill set. I, I, you know, your, your colleague over at the ringer, Steven Ruiz talks all the time about how like deep ball accuracy is a wide receiver stat, which I tend to subscribe to. There were plenty of times on tape this year where he was having to bail out of Penix. Um, he just, he, he finds the ball when he's down there and he can win vertically with these and, and track the ball really well, has great ball skills. I, I love pretty much everything about the guy off the field. It seems like he's a phenomenal kid. Um, he, like he did the whole pony show, which is a little bit cheesy, but like, I still appreciate it at the combine. What, what is there else to love about Roma Dunze? Go ahead. Roma Dunze. I, the, the reasons, the reasons I like a Dunze for him being the wide receiver three and not wide receiver two is actually very similar to what you're saying. And that like, okay. I do think it's very difficult to think of a world where Roma Dunze isn't a productive player. I think that, there's a higher percentage chance Malik Neighbors is a phenom than there is a higher uh, that, that same percentage chance than Roma Dunze to be a phenom, that ceiling right? right now bust potential is probably higher with Malik Neighbors than it is with Roma Dunze and that's like the that's the pick you're making right like for mm -hmm. me if I'm looking at the top of the first round I kind of want to swing a big bat I want to go chase a nuke I want to go chase something that's going to change the way I my team operates for the next like five ten years with Roma Dunze. I understand that there's a higher percentage chance that this guy's like a solid wide receiver too for a long time. The cop I had for him was Miles Austin, which like when Tony Romo was healthy and he was healthy, he was one of the better, like one of the better, more like complete receivers in the league. And I think that's how sure. good Roma Dunze can be. I just think that and it, you're splitting hairs there. It's like Roma Dunze is the guy where I think there's a really good chance. He's a solid wide receiver too. I, I think there's a better chance Malik Namers is like a phenom game breaking type of talent Whereas yeah. at the same time, I think Malik Neighbors, there is this higher percentage chance that he's not someone you're even having in the offense in a couple of years, right? Like there is that like higher range of outcome. So you have to pick your poison there too. Where are you at in terms of your job security as a GM? Are you like, do you do you feel like you can take <laughs> right. this swing from Malik Neighbors or do you just need to get a hit? Do you need to get on base? If you're a GM or you're a front office that needs a freaking single, I think Roma Dunze is your player. If you're a front office that has the leeway to maybe to, you know get a little extra grip on the bat and try and take one deep, then I think you go for Malik Neighbors or obviously Marvin Harrison Jr. That, I mean, that's right on the head there. It's like as as the as the game kind of you know we see these absolute phenoms and Tyree Kills uh, of the world and Justin Jeffersons who they can play all over the field, east to west, uh, every blade of grass. They can run whatever they whatever you need to. That that is what Malik Neighbors and, and by transition also Marvin Harrison can be as well. Romo Dunze is is that guy, like you said, and that's why I I have him at at two. He's the little more safer prospect for me, and I think that he fits every box of a prototypical wide receiver one and you know taking everybody else away he would be the wide receiver one if not for a marvin harrison or malik neighbors in this class any other year i think roma dunze uh with a bullet would be wide receiver one it just happens to be that there are some athletic phenoms in this class alongside with him hey by the way just another thing i had written down uh, he had a broken rib and punctured lung in september which i don't think people like know but he put up that incredible season despite those injuries and never missed a snap um, and the last thing that I had written about him, which is another reason why I have him high is I, I see him as pretty scheme independent. Like, I, I think that he, the fact that he can line up anywhere, the fact that I, he can fill pretty much any role. I, I don't see him having an issue being at least a competent average player in any role on any team. I think that that makes him a pretty universal plug and play guy for any team. Um, but let's talk about Malik neighbors, who is, is your number two, Austin. And I, I agree wholeheartedly. The upside here is is ridiculous. We've been hearing for a month or so now that some teams have him as their wide receiver one. And I don't think that's really a lot of smoke as much as it is just true. I would not be shocked if that's the case. And I won't be that floored if he, you know, if the right team is there and, you know, he ends up going ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr. It's not going to blow my brains out of my skull the way that um, some other situations would be with a one and a two kind of guy explosive and dynamic are the words that come to mind. Uh, he led the entire, the entirety of college football in yards per route run last year. The only thing I have is like, is there any concern with him being able to consistently win on the outside? Give me the case for, for Malik neighbors. Yeah. I, I, I would be kind of shocked if he is ultimately picked over Marvin Harrison jr. I think the team that would be making that decision would be really sticking their neck out there and, and taking a pretty significant risk or working off of information that we simply don't have. Cause 
Mm. We don't we know that we don't have the combine profile. We know that we don't have the athletic testing, whatever, whatever. The tape is the tape. And Marvin Harrison Jr.'s tape is an arm, a leg, maybe a full vehicle better than what Malik Ambrose put out. So if you were picking neighbors over Marvin well, that's Harrison why you Jr. think that then. Yeah, that checks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, you, like if you if you're picking Marvin Harrison Jr. over Malik neighbors, you're having a piece of information I don't have or like you're just seeing something different. Now, with neighbors, why I really like him and why he's my wide receiver, too, is this guy could be a Jamar Chase level impact. This guy right. could be like a. I, there was some times where I wrote down Debo question mark, like with the yak stuff and like how mm -hmm. he also, like how he runs through tackles. And sometimes I'm like, there are times where with Malachi Curl Corley, I feel like on tape would run through contact neighbors was more often running away from contact and leveraging speed. But even when he was making contact, he was a guy that was getting through players. He's a tough player. He's a great player winning on the outside too. Uh, you know, my process, I'm interested in how people watch these guys. I do think that there's people who, where their process is to watch every target, watch every route with this guy. He is mm. someone that is always open, in my opinion. When you turn on the All-22 and you you look at that 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 wider angle and you watch every single route he's running, he is someone that doesn't take a playoff. That's the only receiver in this class where I wrote doesn't take a playoff was Malik Neighbors. And, and I take that I, – when you're watching every route of every guy, you see guys who are like, okay, he's obviously not in the – you know, he's not in the play here or not in the concept. He's going to take this one off. Malik Neighbors is just like running full speed all the time. That is what excites me. Crazy. How he misses – how we miss here – is you know it's still someone that i think is a very young player and needs as he gets to the nfl you're going to be working with different caliber defensive players and i think that's oftentimes the curve but man in terms of like the raw ability he has you know mike renner my former podcast co-host he's like jalen waddle stuff like he can do a lot mm. of things that other guys can't he moves different why does Jalen Waddle not lead the league in receiving every year? Because there's these other little things with the wide receiver position that I do think you have to iron out. One of them being injuries, but a moves different guy, I'll take him. I, I want moves different on my team. Yeah, he he always on tape, he looks like a guy that's constantly playing flag football to me. Like the way that he bends yeah. away from from uh the defender. And like I, I think that's a, a good point of yours that the way that he is more often avoiding content than running through contact. Um, let's talk about the guy that you think is a whole vehicle better than than Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr., who I have written down, like, despite a, a, a downright horrible quarterback situation last year, yeah. still really crazy productive. He's got the full diversity of skills, exceptional ball skills. Um, I, I think people are are overthinking it a bit when they when, you know, they I, I, I'm with you that Marvin is the one over these other two guys. Um, but I, I just. I, maybe I'm buying into the, the media hype a little bit too much that some of these teams see neighbors as the one. I, I still think it's overthinking it a hair to not have him as the number one guy because he has been that guy for so long, maybe a little bit of prospect fatigue in that way. He does what smaller receivers can do, but in a much bigger frame. It, like We've heard all the positives. What's Is there a downside for Marvin Harrison Jr.? Is Can you construct a way in which he does not work besides just getting injured? Well, I don't, I don't think he's Julio Jones. You know, I don't think he's Calvin Johnson. I don't sure. think he's even, I don't even think he's like a Jamar chase type or a Justin Jefferson type in terms of what he can do after the catch. I think mm -hmm. the player yeah. I comp him to, and I think this is the most common comp now for Marvin Harrison Jr. is AJ Green. And I think people forget right. how dominant AJ Green was specifically yep. in money down situations for the Cincinnati Bengals and his prime red zone, go to guy wins all the time. Third downs, go to guy wins all the time. Ball skills, Every 50-50 ball is a 75-25. A.J. Green was not someone that was, even in his prime, like a monster yak player. He won the valuable routes, and he won them a lot. And I think Marvin Harrison Jr., with C.J. Stroud and with Kyle McCord, proved that he can be, you mentioned scheme dependent, he's quarterback independent. Like, like he is someone that he's <laughs> right. just going to win all the time. And he's he is truly, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years. My first mock draft was in 2014. It was on my shitty website called The, the draft one that's going to be on your tombstone? Yeah, yeah, the one that's on my yeah. tombstone. The of the ten years I've been kind of doing this, uh, I feel like he would be the prospect where if he doesn't work out, where he's not even like he like falls is even like a Corey Davis level bust, right? Where like he's in the league trickling, but never really hits his high side. This would be the most surprising miss, and, and I think mm. in terms of like this guy doesn't pan out. I got to reset here. We're going to have to maybe reset, maybe start back up the draftpulse.com, kind of wow. burn down the strategies and like find another way because like I don't understand back to basics. I don't understand how this player misses outside of obviously like an injury or whatever, because everything you hear about the guy, obviously the tape just tells you that this is a rare, rare wide receiver prospect entering the league. Anything to add JT? I mean, that when you talk about the, the number one guys, it, it's so hard to, to find out like what he did wrong. And when you look at some of the tape, it's like, 
there was one play that he takes off in the Michigan game, which leads to an interception, but like, and he's got like nine drops for his entire right. career. Like he's it's not hard always to find his butt off, but you know, he can, it's so hard to find things in his game, but I, I think I'm right there with if, you, if which there is like, if there is like an opportunity, like, I don't think that like, there are some times where like, man, you are so good. Why are you covered on this route? Like why, why aren't, why aren't you open here? Like there are some times I'm not like, I think he's a really good separator, obviously, but I don't mm. like, there are times where you're like, Hmm, probably should have won that route. Probably should be press here. Probably should have, you know, screamed wide open for me. That's not his game. Like I think neighbors is a more consistent, like I, I, to win, I'm creating a yard or more of separation. Whereas Marvin Harrison jr. Is like, I don't, like I can win in other ways. I think that the Penn State game, I always tell people this, turn on the Penn State game. Watch mm-hmm. him versus Kalen King. Kalen King taking full advantage of the of college football's like illegal contact rules or lack thereof. It's like hugging the guy on every play. And in the beginning, you're like, oh, wow, this is like maybe working. And then over time, you're like, oh, my God, he's still winning. Oh, my God, he's just had, he has 150 yards. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Like there's, he's, he's winning with pass interferences. And I, I really do think that at the college level, winning like that. And you mentioned with Roman Dunze, you know where the ball's going. They knew where the ball was going too. And, and yeah, he was still so yeah. found a way to win with CJ Stroud, without CJ Stroud. It did not matter. I, I And like, then you mentioned like some of the, yeah, I know he didn't test, but you see the athlete, you see the size speed, you see like some of those plays where he really turns on the burners. That I think would have put an exclamation point on this whole, like, is he the best receiver? receiving prospect we've seen over the last five years, last 10 years, whatever. If he actually tested, I think we'd be able to have that conversation a little bit more cleanly. But even without it, I think it's fair to say that he's one of the best prospects we've seen over the last five, 10 years. That'll do it, man. That is the top 10-ish wide receivers in the 2024 NFL draft. Austin, thank you so much for spending the time going over this with us. You are fantastic at what you do, and I recommend highly to everybody that is listening, go check out his work over, I know this draft season, you've been all over the Ringer NFL uh, football feed, the, the podcast feed. You, you're writing cycle. articles about Dune Dune 2 buckets and every saw trap ever, which I think is hilarious and amazing, and um, you do an awesome job, so thank you. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right, we'll be back on Sunday talking through all of the linemen in this draft class with Stoney Keeley. If you're a friend uh, f- familiar with our show, then you know he's a friend of the show and he's fantastic at what he does. So we'll keep trucking along just two weeks from today until the draft starts. we got a lot of ground to cover. Until then, for producer JT, I'm your host, Easton Freeze. This has been the Hot Read Podcast. We'll talk to you in a couple of days. Mm-hmm.